So I celebrated my uh, two-year anniversary as FSSA secretary a couple of weeks ago. The average tenure is about a, month, a year and a half. And so <laughs> if something falls out of the sky and whacks me on the head today, you'll know that my, my time was up. So we're going to have a conversation today. It's um, a little bit more personal than my usual, but I hope that's OK. Um, I think the expectations have been set a little bit too high. Um, and so I will, I will try not to let you down and make this hour worth your while. <clears throat> My professional uh, alter ego on Twitter is at ConfectionsMD. It's a nod to my mom, who is a retired home ec teacher and a farmer's daughter. She believes that world happiness will be achieved when children have unlimited opportunities for education and also have baked goods available at all times. Uh, because of her, I came into adulthood uh, with some exceptional skills in the following areas. How to be poor, how to sew, and how to bake. And it turns out these skills are highly translatable into the practice of emergency medicine and also work out well when having four teenage boys and 1.5 million Hoosiers who rely on the services that my agency administers in order to have their basic needs met. An example of this uh, translatable skill occurred in January of 2017 when I started in the role of FSSA secretary for Indiana. One of my first big meetings uh, big girl meetings was with uh, our four managed care company partners and their respective actuarial teams. Super smart folks who do incredible work to administer our Medicaid programs. Um, I was about to become the bad guy for the first time in my career. You know, I've always, I've always been the good guy. I mean, who can dislike a pediatrician? Right? We're pretty nice folks. But now, when you add money to the work, suddenly the game changes a little bit. So I woke up sweating the night before this meeting. I knew my stuff. I knew what I was going to talk about in the meeting was, was correct and based in data. But I, I didn't want to be the bad guy. So I remembered an important day from my past. Uh, for my first day as a faculty in the pediatric emergency department at Riley, I baked three dozen chocolate hazelnut cupcakes made with home ground hazelnut flour covered in dark chocolate ganache icing. And on the top of the container was a note to my awesome ED nurses. I'm new here. Please don't kill me. Love, Jen. <laughs> so with that good lesson in mind, uh, I walked into this particular meeting in my suit bearing three dozen carrot cupcakes. After passing them out and watching the delight of business executives eating the thick cream cheese frosting during introductions, I began. Sirs, these are the only carrots you're going to get today. <laughs> the rest of this meeting is a stick. <laughs> so I've lived my whole life with a desire to both see needs as they present themselves around me and then act with a blend of evidence and compassion. And this has made for a very, very weird career path with largely sort of Don Quixote type endeavors to build system safety nets for people in need despite relatively austere circumstances, whether political, fiscal, or personal. Teddy Roosevelt's quote, to do what you can with what you have where you are, became my mantra right after my residency training when I vowed to keep my head up and my eyes open for opportunities to just do something about the patients that I was seeing every day. And while I was figuring it out, though, I got better at baking. <laughs> I tried to fill the void of feeding people's souls by feeding their tummies in the meantime. Lavender vanilla, apple spice with toasted brown sugar frosting, jelly-filled sea salt caramel chocolate. And I fed my own soul in the meantime. But before I get to that, let me share the fundamental question that in the retrospect, I should have asked myself then, and it really is the heart of what I'd like to ask you today, where do you want to be, inside or outside? There is an inherent dichotomy that's built into this question. It's the tension of or. It's a question of all of us who feel this moral imperative to do something. Do you want to work inside the system to make change or on the outside where your voice can be purely your own? 
I really liked my outside voice, and so without much thought, I started on the outside. My timeline, like most of you, shaped all of that. This is teenager Jen on our family farm uh, just outside of Wichita, Kansas. We spent our summers there as kids helping with harvest and other farm-related labors, and I loved it for a couple of reasons. Most of all, I loved the fact that I could see the result of my work at the end of every day. I usually would sing at the top of my lungs uh, while on the tractor, which resulted in dirt uh, between all of my teeth and much mocking from all of my cousins, um, but I didn't care. Uh, we were feeding people, and it really it meant something. Um, our original farm is named Hungry Hill because the family was poor and hungry, but their products fed others, and they took incredible pride in that work. Uh, my call to medicine was an extension of that early farming desire to do work that mattered. I didn't have anyone in my family in medicine, so when I got to the University of Houston for my undergrad, I went to night school so I could work in one of the inner city NICUs in downtown Houston. And it was there that the world of urban poverty really captured my heart. In the NICU, you know, we take care of little babies who are preterm. They're teeny tiny. And I loved that work. I worked night shifts on Fridays and Saturday nights through all of college. And I got pretty good at it, and I, I decided that medicine was definitely for me. One day, though, as we were working, we got a call that there was a baby coming up from the emergency department, and that the baby was pretty sick and we were going to need to start a resuscitation. This infant, when um, he was brought up to us, was full term. Now, we didn't know what to do with big babies. Like, this is a big baby. <laughs> oh. And the baby was sick. And the mom of this baby was 19, and so was I. And as we were resuscitating this baby, we found out a little bit more of the details of what, would, what had happened. And this 19-year-old mom from inner city Houston had not known that she was pregnant or had been scared to tell anyone, or who knows what the details were. And she had delivered this full-term, beautiful baby in her toilet at home and wasn't sure what to do, and so she left him there. And then she realized that she needed to do something, and so she called the ambulance. And so this beautiful full-term baby boy died because the things that were surrounding this young 19-year-old mom were not adequate to meet her needs. And as I stood across the room from her as also another 19-year-old woman with my whole life in front of me, full of possibility, full of promise, the concept of social determinants of health, even though I had no idea what that term was. I'm not even sure way back then in the old days that term had even been coined. But the idea that there was something fundamentally dividing us around the death of a child that was changing her life irreparably for the future, that something had to change. The difference between us was not right. And in that moment, I didn't know it, I'm 19 and stupid, but there was something that changed and clicked that we have to do something a little bit better because the circumstances that surrounded my life shouldn't be the things that defined what my future looked like. And they certainly shouldn't be the things that define the future of what this young woman's life looks like as well. So what made us so different? And how could I do something? So I didn't know it, of course, but those, that concept of social context, of, how, of what brings people to their healthiest, best life, um, it's actually more powerful than the medicine that I was learning and the career that I was going to begin to start. And so I went home and I baked double chocolate cookies with oatmeal flour for my roommate and I told her all about it. And we made a pledge together that we were gonna, we were gonna do something. And so I became an outsider advocate. I found a home in academic medicine for my need to be a voice for the voiceless. And I went back to school after residency to earn my master's in public health and found my outside voice at Confections MD, <laughs> building safety nets and baking cupcakes. And then something happened. The universe asked the question again, inside or outside? I got the call while sitting on the side of the road with a flat tire. Um, I thought it was AAA, and I answered, yeah, how much longer are you going to be? <laughs> it was not AAA. <laughs> um, it was the chief of staff for then Governor Mike Pence. <laughs> uh, 
uh, I had been pre-vetted on a short list um, for deputy health commissioner at the State Department of Health. Do what you can with what you have where you are, echoed in my brain, and just like that, I became part of the machine. My dad said when I called to let him know, hey honey, you know that when you go work for the government, they will forget your name and you will just be known as the state. And I said, Dad, that's absolutely ridiculous. Um, I am still me. And we can see how that worked out. <laughs> uh, in April of 2015, the highlight of my personal and professional life occurred on the side of Main Street in a small town. There was an unprecedented HIV epidemic in southern Indiana, and I was in charge of the medical response. We set up a one-stop shop that served the multiple needs of the community in one place. It was there that I exchanged the first legal syringe in the state of Indiana. It was a moment of hope. Both the recipient and I cried and hugged. And now a few folks hadn't read the emergency declaration and tried to take me to jail. Um, but I assured them that I was the state. <laughs> <laughs> and we figured it out. I took my boys with me. That's, this is my favorite picture from, from the entirety of our response. But I, I took my boys with me for the first community cleanup day while teaching the residents in the town how to safely pick up used syringes. <clears throat> I talked to them about how we have to be part of meeting people's needs, no matter how hard it might appear. At the end of the day, I knew we could make it work from the inside. And in this moment, something clicked. It's OK to embrace the dichotomy. The tension of or, inside or outside, is resolved in the power of and. Part of the success of our HIV response was the implementation of a unique tool called the Healthy Indiana Plan, which we affectionately call HIP. And I think most of you know about that. It's Indiana's version of Medicaid expansion. We were able to actually launch it a week early for our HIV response, and we signed up nearly the entire town of Austin, Indiana for new health insurance. And when our new governor came in, I was given the opportunity to continue to shepherd this amazing program, and I moved from our state health department to where I am now at FSSA, overseeing a $15 billion budget of Medicaid and social services programs. I am officially the bad guy every day. The daily student in a uh, small college on the East Coast said that I was trying to kill people, and uh, it got picked up in the national press. That was fun. Um, and so I baked cupcakes, and uh, I looked to find holes in the fragile safety net to see if I could sew it back together, like my mom sewed my clothes as a kid. And I sew people's tissues back together in the ER once a week. Amazing things have started to happen over the last two years because when you do what you can with what you have where you are, you are more than you. You are and. That and is really far reaching. Uh, what if social services programs had public health outcomes as their metrics? What if fiscal responsibility that we tout in HIP and patient-centered advocacy were not at odds with each other? We renewed HIP uh, last spring to reflect the needs of Hoosiers. It now includes comprehensive services for substance use disorder with things that I never would have thought possible before. Reimbursement for peer recovery coaches. Coverage of all forms of medication assisted treatment. An echo training program for rural docs wanting to treat hepatitis C and learn how to do medication assisted treatment and much more. It is truly the manifestation of and. Uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Krista Brucker, uh, runs a just-in-time treatment referral program out of the Eskenazi Hospital Emergency Department. She relies on HIP for her patients. She says HIP is about more than paying for visits and medicines. It's about giving folks a chance to access a community of people who care for and about them. I have so many patients whose HIP is the thread that holds together the challenging early weeks in recovery, even as they stumble through relapse. When housing falls through, or a job prospect disappears, HIP allows people to stay connected to positive, consistent, motivational influences instead of descending back into active use. For some, it's the only bright light of hope in an otherwise pretty desperate situation. Our governor said to the HIP team the day after our waiver approval that this is how Indiana gets things done, together with heart. 
And his note on my picture here uh, is how all of my written exchanges with the boss start and end, in caps, DOC and GOV. <laughs> he says in his note, and lives are being positively transformed. The inherent dichotomy of a state with a balanced budget, a healthy reserve, and over 400,000 new insured lives shouldn't be lost. We can do it all. He likes cupcakes too, just in case you were wondering. So HIP was a good start, but it's not enough. It's a play on words. It started as an insurance plan, like Healthy Indiana plan. But what if building a Healthy Indiana just was the plan? Did you know that despite every healthcare innovation of the last two decades, we haven't made a dent in food security since the recession? It's a big deal. And that those with food insecurity are the majority of high cost members of my Medicaid programs? It's all connected. We can't nourish souls until we nourish bodies. So we created the Healthy Opportunities Office at FSSA to bring social determinants of health into healthcare. We started a year ago by asking 10 questions at the end of every Medicaid, SNAP, and TANF application <coughs> on August 4th of this past year. We get about 120,000 of those applications online every single month. And we asked them, we said, hey, we'd really like to know just a little bit more about you so that we can help you better. We had nothing, we didn't promise anything in return. We said, this isn't tied to your benefits at all. We just need to know more about people so that we can build the right things in the right places. Since August 4th, 100,000 people have answered all 10 of those questions. People want to tell us what they need and we are ready to respond. So the, for the first time in the state of Indiana, we have a social context map. We know where people are, what they need, and we can build programs to fill in those safety net gaps. Our Healthy Opportunities Office vision is that all Hoosiers have an equitable access to social and physical supports needed to promote health from birth to end of life. And our mission is to reduce barriers that impede Hoosiers from achieving optimal individual health outcomes. Because we know, like my 19-year-old friend, who at the beginning of what should have been an, the amazing trajectory to her life, that medicine alone wasn't enough. That good health is much more than taking a medicine or going to your doctor's office. It's all about the things that surround you, the way that your community is built, the way that you access your needs, the way that we set up to make healthy choices the easy choice. That's really important. Now the way that I was trained back in residency is that patients would come to see me and I would tell them what to do and that they would leave and do exactly what I said. <laughs> now I haven't successfully taken an entire course of antibiotics maybe in my whole life and so I know that that doesn't work like that. And I have no barriers at all. But what happens when you talk to someone and you give them instructions on how to manage their diabetes a little bit better and they can't even make it to the pharmacy? How do we take health out of the hallowed halls of healthcare quicker because we know that the medical model failed. Now we still need doctors and nurses and hospitals and surgeons and all those things and we need them to be awesome, but we need them to learn our system. We need to learn how to not say this is my lane and that's yours, but this is ours. This is ours collectively to do together. And we've been working on it. And just because the Healthy Opportunities Office just started a year ago doesn't mean that we haven't been actively working on some pretty incredible things to think about connecting individuals at their point of need to that next step. I'll tell you what, there are, there's almost no prescription that I would rather write than a prescription for a house. So how do we take housing as medicine programs and make them reality? How do we embed the drivers for social determinants of health so that Social services are not the afterthought, but they're the primary thought. So how do we get there? For our um, agency in particular, the goal is that social context just becomes how we do business. It's not a pet project. It is the unifier around every program that we deliver. So instead of saying, hey, our SNAP program is meeting all the metrics that it's supposed to, we're killing it. We've got great timeliness. We have great accuracy. 
what I really want to do is make sure that our SNAP program is actually making the, the outcomes that we care about. What does food security in Indiana look like? Are we delivering the, these services in the right place at the right time to the right people? So we need to understand our members better. That's what our survey is, is for on our online applications. We need to build awareness so that my, the folks that work uh, for FSSA all over the state, we have 4,000 folks in local offices, 110 local offices, at least one in every county, that when they encounter people that walk in and say, hey, I need, a, I need SNAP or TANF or Medicaid, that we don't say, great, we will get you all of those, that thing. But we take one step further and say, if you've walked in and you needed that, maybe you need something else too. Do you mind if I ask you a couple of extra questions? Do you have a safe place to stay tonight? And then the next step is if the answer is yes, I can do something about it. And so the training and awareness for the folks that work for us, that work for state government, to be that point of intersection, even if we don't own housing or own transportation, how do we take all of you and build you into this global network of making, making it happen? And so this is our social context screening that deployed um, in August of uh, this past fall. I love being wrong. It's my favorite thing to do is to have an idea and then look at it and then realize I was incorrect. When we started asking these questions, I was fairly certain that the number one answer of what folks needed was going to be transportation. I was absolutely certain. And I was so wrong, it's not even funny. People are hungry. More than double the number of people that applied for SNAP said they needed food. Do you remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs from eighth grade? <laughs> um, on the bottom is things like um, air. <laughs> you know, you've got to be able to breathe. And right next to it is food. You cannot expect anyone to do anything else unless they're fed. We can't ask anybody to do the next step and talk about getting to the top of actualization and you know, a fulfilling life. We've got, we are starting at the bottom. And so how do we make sure that food services are accessible to people where they need them? We can't ask you to do the next thing until we fill that basic need first. So this is, has become our biggest priority is connecting all of our services around those needs. And number two you'll see is that folks say they don't have enough money for healthcare. So how do we make sure that people have access to the services that they need to get those basic need, needs met as well? Now, at the end of this month, um, we will have a landing page on the FSSA website so that I don't have this information, we have this information. We are about 15 counties away to having enough responses to even get down to the block level. So that when you're thinking about building programs, you can do it based on evidence, not based on a gut feeling. So if it's the right thing to open a new food pantry or co-locate it with an office where you are, you'll have the data to support that. And then also the data to see if it's working. Now my question to you, my request, is that when you think about asking social determinants of health questions in your settings, use ours. And then let's pool our data so we have not just the folks that we serve, but the folks that we serve collectively. And we can build those programs. The more we know, the better that we do. Our awareness campaign uh, launches in uh, a month or so. This is a two year long training program that engages our employees to learn how to deal with members who have so many needs that you don't want to get up the next day because you're overwhelmed with how much work we have ahead of us. So this is the idea of we're going to build an agency that, is, that are experts in social context. Educating our associates how to recognize and identify and assist with addressing those needs and then developing an intentional focus so that our entire agency is defined by social determinants of health. And then the fun part that launched uh, in uh, November of this last year is building a community-based organization network team so that we've got a bat phone for all those resources that need to occur just in time in that moment to help our individuals, not just with their individual needs, but then more importantly, building a system, building a network that changes the way that our communities are designed around good health. So here's our timeline. It's fairly aggressive. We are in a little bit of a hurry at FSSA. Um, people are tired, and that's okay, because they're doing great work. But and you have to embed these system changes into the culture of an organization. Otherwise, 
when you've got new leadership, they fade away. And our goal is that uh, when I get hit by a bus, that no one remembers that we did anything any differently than this. Because this is not about me at all. This is about us. This is about thinking about people differently, not as a response to a disaster like a fire or a tornado or a health emergency, but thinking about people upstream so that we can prevent those things from happening in the first place. So let me tell you a little bit about how we got started. Um, we've got a couple of projects that I'd like to highlight, and there are many more, but these are just a couple that we're, we're particularly proud of. The first is our Open Beds program. The Open Beds network is a state-of-the-art software-as-a-service platform that I identifies, unifies, and tracks all behavioral health um, and specifically substance use disorder treatment for inpatient and residential beds. It's sort of like the e-harmony for substance abuse disorder. <laughs> substance use disorder. So if you, if you show up in an emergency department at 2 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, in general, what I would do is look on the board with a thumbtack piece of paper and some scrawled phone number for three providers that are close to you, call up and say, hey, I got a, a guy that was ready for some treatment. Do you have anything? And the answer would be, no, I'm really sorry. Can you call back in a week? We may have an opening then. But when we looked statewide about what our substance use disorder treatment resources looked like, it turned out we had plenty of beds. We just weren't connecting to them in a way that worked. We didn't have what we call a wait list with a capital W. We had a little sort of tiny microscopic wait list, which was those three phone numbers tacked up on the bulletin board. And so open beds really becomes this hub for you show up here, hop on the network, and all of the available beds based on whatever payer you might have or those that will take self-pay or have programs to subsidize treatment, et cetera, those all show up. And those referral beds update their capacity every 24 hours so that you've got real-time capacity. And when somebody's ready for services, you get them there. Because we all know that motivational change relies on the magic moment. And it disappears really fast. And so when we get that magic moment, we get people connected. So just since this program launched, we've connected nearly 600 individuals in less than two hours from the moment of saying, I'm ready. And we had to look at our policies because we, so many folks wanted to use this service that we got ahead of ourselves in Medicaid. <laughs> <laughs> and so we went back and we actually retooled our substance use disorder waiver to make it even easier to access. We are now officially auto-approving 14 days of services from the moment of referral. So we don't have to worry about Monday morning getting a denial that, hey, you came in on Saturday and people getting nervous about not taking services. This is extraordinary work. In a moment, again, in a moment of crisis, we never want to do this again. This is not just about substance use disorder. This is about building networks you know, despite disease process. It's gone so well that we actually are expanding to all of mental health. So if folks need additional treatment services, inpatient or otherwise, this is a platform that we can use to help them. Now, the magic of this is not just referrals for medical treatment. It's that we embedded it in our statewide 211 program. And 211 has access to tens of thousands of social determinants services so that case management occurs the moment you go inpatient or residential and then picks you up when you leave because the key to recovery is not what happens during treatment it's what happens afterwards so this is really exciting stuff and again we think about every time we build a new project we think about how do we fit social context how do we think about how this works in the real world not on paper into the programs that we build the next one you probably have heard about in the paper. This is the one where I, um, from the Daily Student, I'm killing people. So I'll just tell you a little bit about it. Um, so our Gateway to Work program is part of the Healthy Indiana Plan. Governor Holcomb has um, a huge initiative around workforce. And uh, for the first time in the state of Indiana, we actually have more open jobs than people. That's weird. <laughs> That's not happened in decades. And so with that um, prospect, we're, we've been charged, all the agency have, have been charged to think about how do we help individuals that haven't gone back to school, haven't gone back to work, aren't volunteering, aren't engaged in their community, how can we think about adding resources so that those folks may say, you know what, I'm, I'm ready to do that too. And so this is a, a demonstration project. It started January 1st, so it's 24 days old. 
Um, to take a very small subsection of individuals that are part of the Healthy Indiana Plan to say, hey, um, we're going to ask you a few questions, social determinants questions, medical questions, health questions. And if you fall in this category where you know, you're not taking care of a, you know, a little kid at home or you don't have a disability or you haven't recently been in jail or you're not pregnant or you don't have active substance use disorder, there's about you know, 25 or 30 exemption criteria, or you're not doing these things already, working, going to school, volunteering in your community, et cetera, can we help you do the thing that you never thought you would be able to do before? Go back to school for a certificate. Can we pay for that certificate? Can we help connect you with a job in your community? Do you have transportation issues that we might be able to help you with? Throwing the resources at this group of individuals to say, not only do I have a now health insurance, but I have the prospect of a better life. Um, we had our first success story on day six. It's pretty exciting. Um, a gentleman uh, got a, a notice in the mail that he um, should call to do his gateway to work assessment. And so he did it. It's online. You can do it on the phone or online, or there's multiple different ways to do it. And he turned out to be exempt from the program because he'd recently been uh, released from prison. And so he didn't have to do anything. Um, but he called the, his managed care company, uh, which happened to be CareSource, anyway, because he was getting really nervous because he didn't have a job. And he was, having, he was really nervous that no one would hire him because he'd just gotten out of jail. And that doesn't look good on your application all the time. So we called the CareSource Gateway to Work team and they said, oh great, we're going to have you come in and we'll do this additional assessment. And he identified education and transportation as his two biggest barriers to employment. And so they connected him to the Next Level Jobs program and a training program for um, welding technology at Ivy Tech near his home, paid for his tuition, and connected him with a transportation service to make sure that he get, could get there and back every time. This is the magic of thinking about social determinants of health every time you build a new system. That's what we're trying to do here, is we're trying to say that let's not just think about health, let's think about all of it, and let's throw everything we've got at seeing if there's some magic in how we make these connections and think about people as a whole, not just people as participants in individual programs. I am cautiously optimistic that this might be something to be really proud of. Um, we have our eyes on this 24-7, 365 to make sure that every possible way to help people is open and working and done with extraordinary compassion. Um, you might have heard a little bit about the other program. There's one other state that is doing a community engagement program, and it's Arkansas, and they're not doing so well. Um, this program is built very differently than the Arkansas program. Our goal is to not lose a single person from health care coverage because of this, but in fact, to do just the opposite to help people live the lives that they wish they could have all along. And in order to do that, we're building a new program to go along with it as its sister. And we call this the HIP Bridge. No other state has done this, but we've done a whole bunch of stuff that no other states have done, so we might as well do some more. The HIP Bridge program is a model that will take those individuals who have success in the Gateway to Work program, they might get a job, and we have asked them in the past to make really horrible decisions. And let me give you an example. I had a gentleman last year at Christmas time who called me and said, hey, Jen, I wanted to let you know that I'm part of Project Point. I told you about before, uh, Dr. Krista Brucker. And I have been in recovery for six months. I take naltrexone shots uh, every month to make sure that I don't relapse. And I got a job at Lowe's, and I really love it. But it's the holidays, and they've asked me to work mandatory overtime. And that's going to put me over the income eligibility for HIP. And if I don't have HIP, I'm not going to be able to afford my naltrexone shot, which costs $1,500 a month. And I've been asked, basically, by you to choose between this job that I love and dying. Because if I don't have my naltrexone shot, I tell you what, I will go back to heroin. We're asking people to make these choices every day, and it's not fair. It's not right. So the HIP Bridge program is meant to help those individuals who have gone from 137% of the federal poverty level to 139% of the federal poverty level, HIP ends at 138%, to say, here's the support to get you over that hump because you can't bridge that gap alone. So things like letting their uh, power account be portable, 
so that when you move into a new type of coverage, whether that's employer-sponsored insurance or um, uh, the um, expansion through the ACA insurance, that we can cover that gap through HIP in a way that actually meets the needs of the real world. We call it um, getting rid of the cliff and making it a stair step instead. And this is the right way to design programs to meet the needs of real people in the places where they are. We're very excited. Our goal implementation for this is January 1st of 2020 to make sure that people have their needs met while we're building the Gateway to Work program. The next one I'd like to highlight is a dream come true. Uh, this has been four and a half years in the making with a lot of random sidesteps around how to implement. And this is our OB Navigator program. As you may know, Indiana is number seven, and that's worst, not a good number seven, in the country for infant mortality. We are also number three worst in the country for maternal mortality. You're not supposed to die anymore having a baby. That's not how it's supposed to work. We have so much work to do. And the disparities that are embedded in this number are pretty incredible. And so we decided that decades of research and work now needs to be implemented into a program that works for people, regardless of where they live, regardless of what they look like, regardless of what their barriers are. And so hopefully with the help of our legislature through this session, we will be building a statewide OB Navigator program that every single mom who is in uh, one of our Medicaid programs will, as part of their benefits package, get a person. And they'll get a person who's trained, again, outside the halls of medicine to be Velcroed to their arm through the entirety of their pregnancy and the full first year of their child's life. As Dr. Box says, we'd like a lot more Hoosier babies to celebrate their first birthdays. And to do this, uh, we really had to collaborate between three different agencies in ways that have never been done before. So this is a multi-agency um, collaborative between FSSA, ISDH and the Department of Child Services. And what it does is um, when we know that a mom who is asking for Medicaid coverage for pregnancy, when we know that she's pregnant, we reach out and we say, hey, we have this additional part of our benefits package. Would you be willing to meet with someone who will do an initial assessment? If the answer is yes, then we do that intake assessment of what are your medical needs? What are your socioeconomic needs? Hey, those 10 health leads questions come back again, same ones, so that we can meet those barriers. And based on that risk assessment or needs assessment, we make referrals to one of four arms. The first and most complex is the Nurse Family Partnership, which is present in 37 of our counties across Indiana. This is highly trained nurses who do work in homes in an evidence-based manner and, and work with moms. They actually go out to th uh, three years of life um, for this program. So that's where those our highest risk moms will be referred. The next part of the, um, and the next arm is our community health worker program. And so there are community health workers all over the state that are trained in doing perinatal services. And we're very excited about um, launching this program. Medicaid, as of July of last year, now reimburses for community health workers. It's the, we're the first state to do so, and we're, that's the basic platform that really um, makes this program sustainable. We also are building a registry so we know where people are and, uh, and they can sign up um, as community health workers and help with this referral process. The third arm is community paramedicine. There are four community paramedicine programs in Indiana, and we're hoping to support and grow those um, through this process as well. And then last but not least is um, where DCS comes in. Healthy Families is a huge preventive program that Department of Child Services runs with 5,200 people across the state in every county doing prevention services, and we are actively retraining those individuals. Again, already statewide resource to work on perinatal services and again through that first year of life. This is how we save babies. We go to people, ask them what they need, and then fill those needs. So what's the commonality here? Farming, baking, OB services, syringe exchange programs, health insurance. What, what brings all of those things together? Why, why are we here? It's love. Love is all about and. It looks away from or to say we are all in this together. It lets a state, whether red, blue, or purple, 
set up a pre-K program for low-income families. Remember my mom, food and education. <laughs> it lets people reconnect with each other around things that matter. I love my 1.5 million person family, though they keep me awake at night. <laughs> they make being a bad guy on the inside worth it every day. And they challenge me to say and as much as possible. Yes, and. So I think you should join me. I really don't want to do this by myself. <laughs> and who else is going to do it if not us? I have some rules on how I've learned to embrace this dichotomy, and they are simple but critical, and I'd like to share a couple of them with you today. Rule number one is this. Influence happens when you show up. Jeff Sparing was my advisor during residency, and I would follow him off a cliff. Um, he went from running our hospitalist team to join the C-suite at our hospital, and I was so mad. I felt totally abandoned. Um, but he told me that his wife asked him whether he wanted to keep getting bossed around by the jerks or just go ahead and be one of the jerks. <laughs> and he knew that if he ever wanted to see anything change, that he was just going to have to join the ranks of the jerks. And I liked that. Rule number two, after you successfully install yourself with the jerks, don't assimilate. <laughs> your inside voice must still be as loud and as passionate as your outside voice. Confections MD is still my Twitter handle, despite multiple um, requests from my communications team to make it a little more professional. <laughs> Remember what brought you to the table, and don't compromise that to stay at the table. Never ever go, go to bed having compromised your integrity or ha having made a decision that was contrary to your mission. Never. Rule number three, not every possible battle presented is the one you have to win. Some battles you will lose. The long game is worth letting a few things go, so choose them wisely in order to keep on fighting. These rules of compromise and battle are hard to balance, and it's possible this is how. When you choose a hill to die on and you don't actually die, pick another one. <laughs> Keep picking new ones. And rule number four, whatever is your version of baking cupcakes, keep doing it. It's hard to love others when you don't feel loved yourself. The best gift that you can give those whose safety nets you are preserving is preserving your own ability to be kind and warm, even in the face of overwhelming odds and despair. So back to our original question, inside or outside? Where will your voice be heard? Well, it's like my dad says when I ask him, would you like pumpkin or apple cupcakes? His answer is yes. <laughs> There's power in and. The inherent ethical assumption is that you're an advocate or part of the machine. And embracing the dichotomy allows us to find our way faster. It's how we do something. So thanks to my mom for teaching me to bake. And thanks to my life in the ER for teaching me to love deeply. Every last one of us sometime will need something. All of us need someone. When we all decide to be something and someone, then the safety net has no holes. Love, your friendly neighborhood bad guy. Have a cupcake. Thank you. <laughs>